Uh, greetings and welcome to another video. No longer in the Philippines, I'm back in the United States. It's a cold blustery day here just outside of the uh, capital, Washington, D.C. Right now I'm kind of homeless, living with relatives, but I'm hoping to resolve that situation shortly. Uh, the problem is I have no place to set up any of my uh, equipment, so I'm doing this with my camera and my laptop, and we're going to see how it turns out. It's a five-year-old laptop, so again, we'll see. Today's video is going to be on a program called VirtualBox. This program allows you to create virtual machines. We're going to talk about what it is, how to get it, a little bit about the history, why you might want it, and uh, things you can do with it. So it should be pretty interesting. So I'm going to get to it now. With VirtualBox being the subject of this video, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover here and what you can expect to learn. In this video, we'll be talking about VirtualBox. We'll also discuss what a Type 1 and Type 2 hypervisor are. We'll talk about a brief history of hypervisors. Then we'll discuss the various parts of VirtualBox, how to get VirtualBox, how to install VirtualBox, and creating your first virtual machine. The program we're going to be using is actually called Oracle VM VirtualBox. Our short title is VirtualBox, and for really short, we just call it VB. You really gotta love the way these corporate people name things. VirtualBox is a type two hypervisor in that it runs multiple different operating systems, one at a time, not at the same time. Well, you can do that within a virtual environment on your computer, within your existing OS, leaving that OS untouched and unchanged. This allows you to do things like test new distributions of Linux or run Windows on your Linux box. It's not quite the same as running it on bare metal, but it does work. VirtualBox also includes its own virtual network within your computer. We're not going to be doing a lot with it because we're only going to have one virtual machine running, but you can have two, three, four virtual machines and you can actually use this internal virtual network just like you would a real external network. Let's talk about hypervisors. As we said earlier, VirtualBox is a type two hypervisor. That implies there's a type one hypervisor. Type one hypervisors are what is known as bare metal. They run directly on your hardware. Basically, a hypervisor type one has its own operating system built in and doesn't need an external operating system. This makes it faster than a type two hypervisor, but it can require a separate interface and it can be a little bit more complicated to set up. Examples of a type one hypervisor are Proxmox, KVM, and Zen Server. If you note the graphics below, you see we have the hardware layer, the Type 1 hypervisor, and then our multiple guest OSs residing on top of that. For VirtualBox, being a Type 2 hypervisor, it requires a host OS writing on top of the hardware. So basically, VirtualBox's Type 2 hypervisor runs on top of the existing OS, most likely Windows, but could be Linux or Mac. Generally, it's easier to install, easier to use, with a predefined interface manager built into the program itself. It also requires additional resources as part of the hardware needs to be used to run the host OS, and part of it needs to be used to run the hypervisor and the guest OS. Examples of a Type 2 hypervisor are VMware or Oracle VM VirtualBox. You can see from the graphic below, we have the hardware, we have an OS layer on top of that, 
which is our host OS. And then we have our type two hypervisor on top of that. And finally, we get to our guest OS installations on top of the type two hypervisor. Now let's talk about a little historical stuff. This is not everybody's cup of tea, but I find it interesting. If you don't, feel free to skip ahead. Virtualization was first introduced in 1972 when IBM created a hardware assisted virtualization for their VM 370 series mainframe computers. It wasn't until 2005 that Intel added uh, virtualization to the x86 Intel series of CPUs. And in 2006, AMD followed suit by adding the same thing to their x86 series of CPUs. In 2007, Innotech, a German company, released VirtualBox. Innotech was eventually acquired by Sun Micronics in 2008, and Sun Micronics was acquired by Oracle in 2010, and Oracle is the current owner of VirtualBox. The Oracle VM VirtualBox program as it exists today has several parts that you can install. First off is the main program, which you can download from the VirtualBox website. It was released under the GPL version 3 license. This is all you really need to run VirtualBox. However, there isn't a VirtualBox extensions pack also available on the VirtualBox website. It provides additional drivers and services, disk encryption, RDM, NVMe, PXE. This was released under the PUEL license. You don't really need this to run VirtualBox, but it does provide additional features, so it's nice to have. It's a free download, so you might as well install it as well. Finally, guest editions are installed on your virtual machine. This comes bundled with the main VirtualBox program as a separate ISO file. The guest editions provide support in your VM for additional USB 2, USB 3, and shared folders and desktop integration. Shared folders is nice in that you can have a folder on your host computer that is also available inside your guest computer. And a desktop integration simply means you no longer have to hit the right control key in the default configuration to get your mouse pointer back. The actual virtual box window will integrate nicely, much nicer with your desktop than without guest editions. You do have to install guest editions in your virtual machine. You need to mount the ISO for it as if it were a CD-ROM drive and then run the correct installation program to get it working. To get VirtualBox, we need to go to the VirtualBox website. To do this, open any search engine and type VirtualBox as one word into the search bar. Your first link will most likely be the VirtualBox website. Here we can see that the latest version is 7.0. We can see some news along the right side, and we have the download link on the left. Going to the download page, we can see we have the different versions for different operating systems, whether Windows, Mac, Linux, or whatever. You can click on one of those and see all the versions, like, for example, under Linux. We can see that we have Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, Oracle, Linux, Red Hat, Enterprise. Again, select the version that matches the system. This will be the version that matches your host system or the actual computer you're installing this on. Also, you can see the VirtualBox extensions down below. There's only one version which works for all platforms. You can download that also. You may also want to download the checksums and use them to validate your install. It's always a good idea to use the checksums to validate your install. Now we're downloading the Windows host version. We also want to get the 
VirtualBox extensions, and the MD5 checksum so we can validate the downloads. These files should now be available in our download folder. Installing VirtualBox. In our downloads folder, we can find the VirtualBox install package we downloaded. We want to go ahead and double click on that. It'll take a moment for the installer to load. We get the welcome window. We'll just click next here. The following window shows us the various components and the directory we're installing in. I'm going with the defaults in this case. Next, we'll get a warning about VirtualBox virtual network interrupting our actual network during install. And then we'll get a missing dependencies warning on most Windows installations for Python Core, which will be pulled in when you install VirtualBox. We can go ahead at now and uh, just click the install to begin the actual install process. This will take a moment or two to complete. Once it's finished, we can go ahead and click finish and run VirtualBox for the first time. We'll get the VirtualBox welcome screen. We got some menus in the upper left. We're going to take a quick look at. To add the extension pack, we're going to want to go down to tools, extension pack manager. And if it's not already installed, then we can click on the plus install icon to install it. We select our uh, extensions pack we downloaded. We proceed with the install. We agree to the licensing agreement. You got to go all the way to the bottom of the licensing agreement before the agreement tab becomes available. And that's it. The extension pack is installed. We can take a quick look at preferences. We're not really going to change anything here, but just be aware where they are. Under the Tools tab, we also want to take a look at the uh, resources being used by our computer. This is important because both our operating system and the virtual machine will be using resources. We should be aware what we have available when we launch our virtual machines. And we are installed. Let's go ahead and set up our first virtual machine. We are going to want to be on the welcome page for the virtual box application. There is a new icon towards the uh, in the upper section of the window towards the right, we're going to click on that. This will start the new machine process. The first thing we need to do is give our machine a meaningful name that we'll remember. We also have the folder it's installed in. You notice with the name, I type Arch. It automatically knows this is a Linux installation, and it's Arch Linux 64 base. That's filled out for us automatically. Then we want to select an ISO we downloaded, in this case, the Arch Linux ISO. There is no unattended install with Arch, so that option is not available. Now we want to set up for memory and our number of processors in our CPU. We are going to go ahead and give us four gigs for this machine. You'll see the red lines indicate the danger zone where we're interfering on what's going to be needed by our host operating system. We also set up two CPUs. EFI is not enabled by default. But since it's a default installation, we're going to go ahead and enable it. Now we're going to create a virtual hard drive. 
We're going to use a 40 gig one. This is going to fill up as it's used. We're not going to create the full hard drive immediately. It'll adjust as we add or delete stuff. The rest of these options remain as they are. We can take a review of what we set up so far. And then we can go ahead and click finish. And we've created our first virtual machine. But before we launch it, we want to go back into settings. So we'll click on it, select the settings icon. And we'll go through our settings. First thing I want to do is in addition to the title, I want to give it a description and a date, which will also help me remember what this machine is for and why I made it. We'll go to the systems next. We've already set our memory and our processor tabs. We'll just double check our settings here and make sure everything's as it should be. Uh, we can uncheck the floppy as we don't really need it. And we can move our hard disk to first in the boot order. And the floppy to last. We go to our display. We can get by with 16 megabytes since this virtual machine is going to be text only at this point. If you're going to be using a GUI, you might want to bump this up all the way to 128 megabytes. For now, we're going to leave it at 16. Single monitor. There's several different display options, and these will all depend on what your base OS is as to whether it will let you use them or not. Actually, let's use any of them. You just get an error message on some of them, but you can still use them. We'll go ahead and look at our storage. We can see our ISO file mounted as a CD-ROM. We can see our hard drive. We'll take a quick look at some of the other uh, options available under settings. We're going to leave most of these at their default. There are a variety of network cards you can use or network types. We're going to leave this at the default NAT for now. Depending on what you're doing, you might want to use bridged or some other mode. The serial ports, we're not going to create any for this machine. Right now we're at USB 2 because we haven't loaded up the machine and installed the guest editions. We're not going to do that in this video, but we will do it later, but we'll leave this as it is for now. Again, not having guest editions installed, we're not having a shared folder, so this is going to stay as it is for now. Some other general stuff, we're going to leave it defaults. This would be adjusted depending on the specific purposes of your machine. And now our machine's set up and ready for the first run. Launching our VM for the first time. Now that we've created a virtual machine, let's go ahead and launch it for the first time. In this case, we will click on the virtual machine and use the start button. It'll take a few moments for the virtual machine to start up. We will get some uh, warning messages about desktop integration and the uh, key, which, is, uh, which by default is the con right control key to allow us to get their mouse pointer back. As you can see, we're booting off of our Arch ISO media, just as if it was an install CD-ROM or USB key. This is not as fast as an actual computer, since we're running on top of a host OS, but it does OK.
we'll see that scrolling across as the machine boots up. And here you can see we've arrived. So at this point, Arch has been installed within our virtual machine as a virtual system within RAM. This is the normal Arch install. So at this point, we can say the virtual machine works as it should. This is a warning about mouse capture. Again, right control key to get the mouse pointer back. And as you can see, we can enter a few commands and it is working. The resolution is only 800 by 600, but that's fine for text. If we made a, a graphical user interface, we would probably want to change that, but it's fine as it is right now. We can go ahead and click the close icon. We can choose to power down the machine. Or we can choose to shut it down to save its current state. We will shut the machine down internally from within the machine. It's a normal shutdown like you would any other computer. We'll just enter the command, command line here and it'll turn itself off. And we've run our virtual machine for the first time now. This brings us to the end of this video. In this video, we discussed what VirtualBox is, what type one, type two hypervisors are. We looked a little bit at history. We talked about the parts of VirtualBox. We discussed how to acquire VirtualBox, how to install it, and creating your first virtual machine. This was a brief, short introduction, but I hope it was helpful to you. Thanks for watching.